Bible, turn to the 666th chapter. The Bible, 666th chapter of the Bible, turn there. All right, I'll make it easy on you. Turn to the 500th chapter of the Bible. No? All right, I'll make it real easy. Turn to the 70th chapter of the Bible. Now, that one you should be able to find. 70th chapter of the Bible. So how do we find that out? Genesis has... 50 chapters, so plus 20, and that'll take you to Exodus 20. And I want you to look in what's in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Seven, this is how you get 70. You multiply seven times 10. Now, what I want you to do is look at verse 1. And I want you to count the number of words that's in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 20, the 70th chapter of the Bible. How many words? Seven words. And seven, what would you say the number seven represents? It is God's perfect number. It stands for perfection, completion, uh, everything that's right and holy. How many spirits of God are there? Seven spirits of God. Did you know the phrase Holy Spirit is in your King James Bible exactly seven times? Not six, not 28, seven times exactly, and there are seven spirits of God. Now, let me take you on the journey that I went on several years ago. Uh, my story is uh, I've been pastoring the church that I have called home since 1974. Uh, I've been pastoring there since 1996. I uh, uh, was uh, born again there at that church. I was baptized at that church. I surrendered to the ministry at that church in 1982. Uh, in 1982 was when I met that young lady sitting right back there, although I didn't like her and she didn't like me. And there's still a few days where it's iffy. But anyway, um, I did three years. I did my three year stint in Bible prison. I mean, Bible college and um, came home. We fell in love with each other, got married at that church, Bethel Church. I went and pastored a little bitty country church for about three years, right back at Bethel I was, 1996, I became the pastor. 1997, God said, let's study prophecy. And I went, great, I'm going to go buy a bunch of prophecy books and read them because there's some new ones out I've been wanting to buy. And God said, no, I wrote a book on prophecy. And I went, what's it called? It's the Bible. It is a more sure word of prophecy. And I went, Wow, that's pretty neat. God, you're a genius. God, where do you want me to start? You want me to start in Daniel? You want me to start in Revelation? Because those are the two, like, prophecy books in the Bible, right? Do you know that Revelation is the 27th book of the New Testament? Do you know that Daniel is the 27th book of the Old Testament? They line up, don't they? What I'm going to show you tonight, I'm going to show it to you this week, is that everything that God does is in order. And if you see something out of order, it ain't God. Amen? Amen. So you're, you've already found the 70th chapter. Of the, and isn't it neat that the Ten Commandments are in that one chapter, in that one place? I looked at that and I went, that can't be an accident. So... Uh, as I'm reading the Bible, and that's what God wanted me to do. I didn't go to no prophecy school. Again, I didn't read anybody's books. I didn't read anybody's commentaries. I just started reading the Bible. And at the time now, three years of, 
of free will Baptist Bible colleges, three years of two different free will Baptist Bible colleges, told me that there was mistakes in all the Bible, that I could not trust any of the translations of the Bible, that I had to go to the Greek and Hebrew. So I made a B plus in Greek and a D minus in Revelation. So I'm an expert tonight on prophecy. But what I did was, I just threw everything out. I said, God, I'll, I'll just toss everything that I've, that I've ever learned. You put it back in me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a lot of questions, God, and you show me what to believe. And it wasn't, that was 97, God called me to study prophecy, and it wasn't until somewhere in 98 that the Holy Ghost finally came to me, and he said, Mike, that King James is right, and you've known it all along, but that King James is right in everything that it says, and I'm going to show you why. And I'm not, a, I'm not a Greek text expert. I'm not going to tell you why this Bible is better than this Bible and what textual manuscripts are better than this. I'm going to show you from the Bible itself why this Bible is right 100% of the time and why everything that it says is in order. So let me give you a few things. If you're taking notes, and um, I'll, that's me telling you to get a piece of paper and pen out and write this down. If you're taking notes, let me give you uh, four, four simple things. If you're, if you're a student of the Bible and you're like me, you want to know what's going on in this world, don't you? You want to know maybe how close we are to the coming of the Lord. Now, I don't know that, and I don't do that. I don't date set. I don't tell you, oh, boy, I think this year, I think, I think it's going to be next year. I think it's going to be January 2nd. I'm not going to, I never do that. I never set a date. People ask me all the time, Pastor Mike, when do you think the rapture is going to happen? And I always say, at the last trump. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trump. So that's what I tell them. That's all I know is at the last trump. But let me give you four things when you're studying the Bible Four rules, four real simple principles. Uh, number one is you have to believe that everything that you're reading in this King James Bible is 100% true, and it's not up to you to change the words in it. It's up to the Bible to change your thinking. Amen? So it's got to be, you've got to believe that it's 100% true. Number two, uh, let me give you rules concerning the prophets. I used to try to get up every morning back when my wife worked in, a, in, a, uh, in an office building, and I'd, I'd get up with her before I'd take the kids over to grandma's and then go off to work myself, and I'd try to read the Bible early in the morning, and I'm not a morning person, but I'd try to read like the Old Testament, and I'm trying to read the prophets, and I'm just going, this doesn't make sense. And why am I reading this? This stuff happened 3,000 years ago. Big deal. You know, who did what back then? It's all been fulfilled. But I found out that I was wrong. So when you're reading Isaiah, when you're reading Jeremiah, when you're reading Malachi or Micah, or when you're, when you're reading any of the prophets, even David in the Psalms, understand the Bible says, for God speaketh once, Yea, twice in a dream and a vision. David said in the book of Psalms, once I've heard this, twice I've heard this. God speaketh once, yea, twice. And I want you to notice, take your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter 2. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. The prophets always speak twice. There is always going to be a partial fulfillment of what the Holy Ghost said and then there is always going to be a perfect latter days fulfillment of what the Holy Ghost said. We know in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost fell on them. They all began to speak with tongues. And uh, Peter stood up and he begins preaching the first sermon, I guess, of that time. The Holy Ghost fell. Now Peter's going to preach the first sermon. And he's preaching out of the prophet Joel. And this is what he says in verse... Uh, 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now we know that happened on the day of Pentecost. 
Then he said, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, did that happen on the day of Pentecost? No. The sun wasn't darkened. The moon didn't turn to blood. The stars of heaven didn't fall or withdraw their shining on the day of Pentecost. That did not happen. So what does that mean? Does it mean that God just threw that in there as like a metaphor for something? Does it mean that the Bible is only partially right or that somebody added that years later? No. What it means is, is that although God fulfilled part of what he said here, he didn't fulfill all of what he said here, but he's going to. There's going to come a day, my friends, when the sun's going to be darkened and the moon's going to turn to blood and the stars are going to withdraw their shining. You can see it in uh, Isaiah 13. You can see it in Revelation chapter 6. You can see it in other places of the Bible. There is a day yet to come that God is going to do these things. So this prophecy has a double Fulfillment. Let me give you another example. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. You didn't mind bringing a Bible to church tonight, did you? Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus being tempted by the devil. And um, he, he accomplishes that. He comes down from the mountain and then he goes into the synagogue. And the, and the Bible says that um, in verse 16 of Luke 4, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Here's what's interesting. How many chapters does Isaiah have? Sixty-six. How many books does the Bible have? There's a reason why. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold your place there in Luke 4. I want you to put your hand there or a bookmark there. And I want you to turn back to Isaiah 63, I think it is. Isaiah 63 or, let's see. No, Isaiah 61. And I want, you, I want you to do this with your Bible. It should look like something like this, okay? We're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. We're going, to do, we're going to do what the Holy Ghost said, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Now, in, back in Luke 17, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord, verse 20, and he closed the book. And he said... Uh, later on, he said in verse 21, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, hold your spot there in Luke 4 and turn back to Isaiah 61. Verse 1 says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Notice there's a comma there. But at that comma, Jesus closed the book, but was the sentence over with in Isaiah 61? No, because it, then it says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, we know that Jesus, when he came the first time, he came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is now, by the way. Now the door's open for anybody to come into the ark and be saved. Somebody say Amen. But he closed the book at that spot. And he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. But then you read on and it says, and the day of the vengeance of our God. Well, the day of vengeance hasn't come yet, but it is coming one of these days. Amen. So you know what's going to happen? Jesus is going to open the book back up. He's going to read the rest of the verse and everybody in the world is going to go, uh-oh, except us. Amen? Amen? 
So you know now that the prophets speak twice. There's always a partial fulfillment and a latter day fulfillment. Okay? So that's number two. Number three. I call it apocalyptic language. Apocalypse simply means revealed. There is a language structure in this King James Bible that there isn't a Bible in the world that can compare to it. Not a Bible in the world that can compare to it. So if I say, let me give you a word. The word stone or the word rock. Who can tell me a passage of scripture or a story in the Bible that has a stone or a rock in it? Huh? The stone of offense. Jesus is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. And who, who did I just say was? Jesus, right? Give me, a, give me a story in the Bible. It's got a rock in it or a stone. The stone that was rolled away, okay? Give me another one. What about the one that Moses smoked? What happened when he smote it? Water came out of it. Guess who that rock was? Paul said it was Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, that rock was Christ. So you can take the word stone or the word rock and go all through the scriptures and you can see, well, there's Jesus there. 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 All by this one word, stone, or the word rock. So there's a language structure in this Bible. Uh, I may give you some more of that as we move on. And then, it's what we're going to learn tonight. We're going to learn to count. Now, I know I'm in Arkansas, but I did hear that one time you guys learned how to count. Say amen. amen. I'm just teasing. I was born in Arkansas. Pine Bluff, who knows where that is? Pine Bluff. On the other side of the levee, the wrong side of the levee, the cotton field side of the levee. And of course, we moved out before the Clintons took over, so I was in good shape. But let's learn how to count. Okay, we already mentioned the number seven, and we're going to talk about that number in a little bit. But let's do this. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis chapter one. And let me just run down a list of, the, of numbers for you. And we'll just have some fun for a little while. The number one. What do you think the number one means in the Bible? Huh? God, the beginning. So what do you have in Genesis 1, verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You mentioned God. Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's a number first. Not second, not third, not fourth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So the number one belongs to Christ. It shows unity. It shows, and they were all with one accord. Okay? Uh, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are... So we see what the number one represents, and the number one is represented in Genesis chapter one. It's represented on the first day of the week where God said, let there be light, and there was light. So let's look at the number two. What does the number two mean, do you think? What does it mean? What does it represent? Give me an example. The two witnesses, okay? How many testaments do we have? Two, Old Testament, New Testament. So the number two represents division, but it also represents unity. So look on day two of creation. Day two of creation in Genesis chapter one, God said, let there be a firmament amidst the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. The number two represents division. When there was one man in the Garden of Eden, God saw it, said that it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. And what did God do? He took the rib from Adam, divided Adam, made him the wife, brought them together. And what did Adam say? Therefore shall the man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
And that's in Genesis chapter 2. What does the number 3 represent, do you think? The Godhead, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So these three are one. Uh, how about resurrection? What day did Jesus rise from the dead? Third day, in Hosea chapter 6, it says, After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up again, and we shall live again in his sight. So the number two represents the Godhead. It represents resurrection. But let me give you another. Let me give you another thing that the number three represents. How about this one? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now follow me on this one because this one gets pretty neat. What happened in Genesis chapter three? The serpent showed up and he tempted Eve with... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You follow me so far? Okay, so now watch this. Adam had Cain and then Abel, but Cain slew Abel. None of Cain's um, offspring survived the flood, so God gave Adam and Eve another son to take his place. His name was what? Seth. Seth was the third-born son. Now, everybody in this room and everybody in the world came from Seth, didn't they? What number, son? So are we all sinners? Because they passed it down to Seth, didn't they? So then sin gets passed down to Noah. And how many sons does Noah have? Shem, Ham, and Bacon. Uh, Japheth. Got bacon on my mind. Three sons. And everybody in the world came from those three sons. You see how sin's being passed down to the three then it gets passed down to Abraham, and Abraham has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob has how many sons? Twelve. What was the third son of Jacob? Does anybody know? Reuben, Simeon, Levi. What's the third book of the Bible? Leviticus named after who? The third son. You know how many chapters Leviticus has in it? 27. You know what number that is? Three times three times three. And you know what Leviticus deals with? The price of of sin. Sin then gets transmitted all the way down until Jesus is born. Jesus is born, and at 30 years of age, he begins his ministry, and we know by way of the Passover that Jesus was how old when he went to the cross? 33. And how many pieces of silver was he betrayed for? 30. And how many crosses were on Golgotha's hill on that day? Because he was numbered with the transgressors. And what was the last words that he said on the cross? One, two, three. It is finished. And then he rose again three days later. Isn't that neat? Everything God does is in perfect order. Uh, number four, look at, look at Genesis 4. Here we have the two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain, the Bible says, was of that wicked one. So Cain represents Satan. Abel the Bible says his deeds were righteous, and the Bible says his sacrifice was accepted. Guess who Abel represents? Christ. And we're in Genesis 4, and the story of Christ is contained in how many books of the Bible? 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And I can tell you that anytime you see the number four, in fact, let me give you this. Um, the 12 tribes of Israel were Jacob's sons, but how many wives uh, did they come from? Were they born from? Rachel, Leah, Billa, Zilpah. They were born of four. You follow me? And they're God's chosen people, and God offers salvation to them. I got, I got a better one than that. How many people built the ark? Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the ark was Christ. The ark is what saved the people who were going to be saved when God destroyed the earth. The earth. So anytime you see the number four in the Bible, you're looking at a picture of the gospel. There's more that it means, but I don't have time for that. The number five. In fact, turn to Genesis chapter five. I'll tell you, let's look at something here. Let's examine our Bibles very carefully. I want you to look in Genesis chapter five. Look at the first five verses and look for the name Adam. Number one, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Verse two. God called their name Adam. Verse 3, and Adam lived. Verse 4, and the days of Adam were uh, after he had begotten Seth. Verse 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Adam's name is mentioned five times in the fifth book of the Bible, and he died. Now look at verse 3. We have Seth. Seth is mentioned one time in verse 3. Seth is mentioned in verse 4. It skips verse 5, he's mentioned in verse 6, he's mentioned in verse 7, and in verse 8, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Seth's name is mentioned five times in Genesis 5, and he died. Now look at verse 6. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. So we have Enos mentioned in verse 6. Enos is mentioned in verse 7. It skips verse 8. He's mentioned in verse 9. He's mentioned in verse 10. And in verse 11, all the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. So it's mentioned five times and he died. And that pattern is repeated with every name in Genesis chapter 5. They're all mentioned five times and they died, except Enoch. Enoch didn't die, did he? He was translated into heaven. And the other exception is Noah. The fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, it says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, how many books did Moses write? Five books. And they're called the law of sin and death. So the number five represents death. However, um, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4. Some of you are going, well, if I thought I was going to have to turn my Bible this much, I wouldn't come with this. This is church. This is not Johnny Carson. 1 Thessalonians 4. Watch this. Verse 16. For the, let's count. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, and with the voice of the archangel, that's number two, and with the trump of God, that's number three, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, that's number four, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. We're just like Enoch. Five things happen at the, at the uh, rapture, and we're caught up and we escape Death, or we have victory over death. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. You're going to find the exact same number and the exact same pattern there. 1 Corinthians 15. You can call this a forensic examination of the King James Bible because that's what we're doing. We're cutting it up and breaking it down. First Corinthians 15. Look at verse... 51, behold, I show you a mystery. By the way, you probably don't know this, but that's the fifth time the word mystery is mentioned in your King James Bible. Imagine that. 
We shall not all sleep. That's the first thing. But we shall all be changed. That's the second thing. In a moment. That's the third thing. In the twinkling of an eye. That's the fourth thing. At the last trump. That's the fifth thing. Same pattern. Same thing happening. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. I'll show you another one. I don't know why you people ain't doing flip-flops in the aisle and getting excited and throwing stuff in the air and shouting hallelujah. Too old? I got you. Hey, I, listen, I learned a long time ago the difference between a live church and a dead church, okay? If you were to take two chickens, put them in a box and show them like from the from the body down. Take one chicken, cut his head off. What will he do for the first five minutes? Dance and dance and flop and flop and flop. What's the other chicken going to do? Just stand there. But after a while, after the flopping's gone, what does the first chicken do? He dies. He ends up in a frying pan. How do we tell which chicken was alive? It's the one still standing. Somebody say amen. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Amen. Oh, looky here. Second, who was the two people in the Bible that were raptured? Enoch and who? Elijah. And look at 2 Kings 2. This is where Elijah gets translated. And I want you to look at verse 7 and tell me how many men were watching it happen. 50. There's that number 5 again. And it's that way all through the Scriptures. How many stones did David pick up? Five. Did you ever ask number 1, why did God even have to put that in the text? Because he only used one. Okay? But remember what stone represents. Christ. How many times was Christ pierced, by the way? One, two, three, four, five. And that's how you and I get to live forever. Somebody say amen. All right. That's enough. So numbers mean something. When you see a number in the Bible, numbers like four, 40, 40, 40 days. How many things in the Bible happened like for 40 days? It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Moses was up on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah, or yeah, Elijah was fed by ravens. He went in the strength of that meat for how long? 40 days. Okay? Those numbers are there for a reason. They're telling you something. Jesus fasted for how long? 40 days. Um, how many times did they march around Jericho? 13. 13. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. And what does 13 represent? Turn to Revelation 17. This will jump out the page at you and tell you what the number 13 represents. By the way, you can find, you can look at Genesis 13 too and find out what the number 13 means. The number meaning is in the Genesis chapter. Do you know that in Genesis 8, eight people walk off the ark? New beginning. Do you know in Genesis 9, God said, be fruitful and multiply? The number nine, be fruitful. How long does a woman carry a child in her womb? Nine months. How old was Sarah when she gave birth? Ninety. You know how many times the phrase Holy Ghost is in your Bible? Ninety times exactly. How many fruits of the Spirit are there? Nine. How many gifts of the Spirit are there, like the gift of the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge? There's nine. Blessed art thou above women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. He's number nine. 
By the way, the nine fruits of the Spirit are in the book of Galatians. That's the ninth book of the New Testament. Listen, it gets better. I'm not done. What did I tell you to turn to? Revelation, why? Oh, Reve Revelation 17. Look at verse 5. See that, big, see that big, bold writing there? Count the number of words that are in all caps. 13. Jericho represents Babylon the Great. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Jeremiah 51 says the walls of Babylon are fallen. And what happened at Jericho? The walls fell. Jericho is a foreshadowing. It's a prophecy of what's going to happen to Babylon in the last days. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Here's why, here's why I do this. Because when God first told me, Mike, I want you to start counting things and learn numbers, I, I refused. Because I thought it was occult numerology. I studied a little bit about witchcraft. I knew a little bit about the occult. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I won't do it. But then God kind of calmed me down, and he showed me something. Ecclesiastes 7.25, I applied my heart to know, and it's up on the screen, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom. So Solomon is writing this, and he says, I, I looked to find wisdom and the reason of things, and to know wickedness of folly, even the foolishness of madness. And look at verse 27. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. So he wanted to know wisdom, and he said, I found it by counting one by one to find out the account. Now, Ecclesiastes 7 is the 666th chapter of the Bible. Now, Revelation 13. Look at this verse. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So you have two witnesses in the Bible, one Old Testament, one New Testament. They're both associated with the exact same number, 666, and they're both telling you that wisdom and knowledge and understanding comes by counting. So I'm like monk. I count everything. Okay, I count things. When I see a list in the Bible, I count it. I want to know what that is. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion. Now, let me give you, let me give you this. The number 33 is the number for wisdom and understanding. How old was Jesus? Where does, our, where does our wisdom come from? It comes from Christ, doesn't it? So notice verse 33 and it says, God is not the author of confusion. What does an author do? Writes books. God is the author of order, is, what this, is the reverse of what this verse is saying. But of peace as in all the churches. My favorite verse, what drove me to do this study was Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Now, you want to hear something neat? You remember when Herod heard that Christ was born, and the wise men came, and he called for the scribes, and Herod was going to kill him. And Herod said, where is he to be born that is born king of the Jews? And the scribes went and searched the scriptures, and they found in the book of what? Where'd they find it at? Micah. That he was to be born in Bethlehem. Micah is the 33rd book of the Bible. They went searching for wisdom for where Jesus was to be born, and they found it in the 33rd book of the Bible. Do you think that's an accident? Can't be. So let's look at the number seven. You were right, ma'am. God bless you for saying that the number seven represents completion. It tells you right here in Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God ended. See the language? He ended. Seventh day, he ended his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed 
the seventh day and sanctified it. So it has multiple meanings. Blessing, rest, ended, finished, sanctification, being made holy, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So let's look at the number seven in the Bible, how it's used. Genesis 7, in Genesis 7, God ended the world. Think about it. It's in the seventh chapter of the Bible that God ended the world. And he tells Noah, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. There is another number, 40 days. We won't get into that. We don't have time. But there is another number there, and it has meaning to it, has substance. It's a prophecy in itself. So he tells him seven days and it's going to rain. And he tells him this in the seventh chapter of the Bible and God ends everything, ends all life on earth. And then the number eight is the number for new beginnings. And in the eighth chapter of the Bible, eight people walk off the ark into a new world. Genesis 29, 27, uh, he said, fulfill her week. How long is a week? Seven days, and we will give thee also for the service which thou shalt serve me uh, yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. Did you know the word week or weeks is found 28 times in the King James Bible? That's seven times four. God put that word, week, which means seven days, in your Bible, a multiple of seven times in your Bible. God did that. The translators, there's no way in the world. When I get done showing you all this stuff, you'll go, there's no way that man could have done this. No way. Deuteronomy 16, seven weeks shalt thou number uh, unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put sickle to the corn. That's what the Pentecost was going to be based upon. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks. Remember, weeks is seven days. Unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of free will offering of thine hand. So seven weeks is seven times seven, which is what? 49. I have it up there on this. You should have answered that. It was easy. Well, I'm giving you all the answers. I'm just, this, this is the easiest test in the world you'll ever take. How much is seven times seven, everybody? Very good. Daniel 9, 24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now let's watch it. Let's count because there's a list here. God said, number one, to finish the, tra- finish the transgression, two, make an end of sins, three, to make reconciliation for iniquity, four, to bring in everlasting righteousness, five, to seal up the vision, six, and prophecy, seven, and to anoint the most holy. Seven things that God's going to do, and he's going to do it in 70 times seven days, 490 days 70 weeks. Now think about it. Didn't they ask Jesus a question, something about how often shall I forgive my brother? And what did he say? And he, they said until seven times? 70 times seven. And looky here. Jesus is going to take 490 days And he's going to do seven things for Israel, and every one of them have to do with forgiving their sins. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them. The word finished is found exactly 42 times in the King James Bible, 7 times 6. Verse 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. The word rested is found exactly 21 times. That's 7 times 3. The phrase seventh day, seventh month, total together equals 77 times in the Old Testament. God put that in there. Exodus 16, six days shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. The word Sabbath is mentioned exactly 77 times in the Old Testament. Just like the word seventh day and seventh month, 77 times. Sabbath is mentioned 77 times in the Old Testament. 
Leviticus, thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. In the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. So the word seven times is mentioned 35 times in the Bible, seven times five. Seven years is mentioned 42 times, which is seven times six. You add them both together, you get 77. So 77 here, 77 here, 77 here. Does anybody think I'm making this up? Does anybody think this could be an accident? What I'm giving you is fact. What I'm giving you is fact. You can count it yourself to see whether I'm right or not. What you do with the fact is your business. But let me give you an illustration. If I'm walking down the sidewalk here in Fort Smith and I see a penny on the sidewalk, I bend down, I pick up the penny, and I go, somebody dropped a penny, and I put it in my pocket. And I take 10 steps more down the sidewalk, and I see another penny. So I reach down, and I said, somebody's dropping change. I put that penny in my pocket. I take 10 more steps, and there's another penny there. Now, by the time I get to that third penny, after walking 10 more steps, I'm going, who's putting money on the ground? put it in my pocket. I take 10 more steps, there's another penny. I put it in my pocket. 10 more steps, there's another penny. I put it in my pocket. What's going on? Is it just luck that somebody is dropping a penny out of their pocket every 10 steps exactly? And I keep, and I do this all day long, and I've, by the end of the day, I've got like 100 pennies in my pocket. Somebody's doing it on purpose. You may not ever figure out why, but somebody's doing it on purpose. Amen? You don't look at the white lines in the middle of the highway and say, they got there by accident, do you? You don't look at your watch and say, well, it's 8 o'clock, it's time to go especially while I'm preaching. You don't look at your watch and say, this just accidentally fell on my hand. Nobody made it. It's just there. It was done on purpose. God said, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain. The phrase seven days is mentioned 98 times in the Bible, which is seven times seven times two. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. The word cease is mentioned 70 times in the Bible. The word finished 42 times in the Bible. The word perfectly seven times in the Bible. Perfectly. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. The phrase the end of the world is mentioned seven times in your King James Bible. And how many days are there in a week? And according to Peter and David both, a day with the Lord is as a... And we've already accomplished somewhere around 6,000 years since the creation. You think we've got another 1,000 years of rest that God's going to let this world rest from all of its wars all of its turmoils. Jesus Christ himself is going to come and reign for how long? A thousand years. That's a number, by the way. Acts 13, 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set there to be a light for the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation under the ends of the earth. The phrase ends of the earth is 28 times in the Bible, seven times four. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. There, here, God's holding a book, and it's got how many seals on it? Seven. And then we have in Revelation 8, we have seven trumpets. And in Revelation 21, we have seven angels. They had seven vials with the seven last plagues on it. See, Revelation is when God is going to end everything and start all over again with a new heaven and a new earth, just like in the days of Noah. That's why he does everything in Revelation in sevens. He's telling you, I'm going to end it right here and right now. 
Uh, Genesis 14, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven. The phrase most high, which is God's, God's name, is mentioned exactly 49 times, which is seven times seven. Think about this. How many angels are there? How many angels are there? They're what? Innumerable, which means what? Can't count them. What's the last number? There isn't one. Because you can do what Joe Biden does with taxes, just keep adding zeros. I didn't make anybody mad, did I? Because I don't care. <laughs> the last number doesn't exist. You just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. So I'm going to tell you how smart God is. Number one, there is no end to numbers, and yet God is the most high of everything. Number two, since we are at, uh, surrounded by an innumerable company of angels, that means there's no, they're an infinite number. They keep going and going and going like the, like the numbers do. And yet, God knows how to take and divide a third of them off and cast them out of heaven. God can take an innumerable amount and cut a third of it off. That's smart God, amen? amen. He's got everything figured out, folks. It's okay to trust him. He is smarter than all of us. Yes. Amen. So how many times was the most high mentioned? 49 times, seven times seven. Psalm 16, 10, thou shalt not leave thy, my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The, one, the phrase holy one is mentioned 48 times. However, in Isaiah, it calls him the lofty one whose name is holy. That makes it 49 times. So we have most high 49 times, holy one 49 times, seven times seven. And then we have the angel of the Lord. That's mentioned 56 times in the Old Testament, seven times nine. And who was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? It was Jesus. At, uh, the Lord God of Israel, the phrase God of Israel, 203 times, which is seven times 29. The phrase Lord God is mentioned 546 times. That's seven times 78. It's like every time you find God's name, it's a multiple of seven or seven itself. Like the phrase Holy Spirit, exactly seven times in your King James Bible. The phrase God Almighty, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The phrase God Almighty is 11 times. But then the phrase Almighty God is three times, making it 14. That's seven times two. Mm, 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 mm. Are you holding in your hand a perfect Bible? Look at this phrase, King of kings and Lord of lords. Seven words, all in capital letter, just like that mystery Babylon thing. It, it like wants you, to, it wants it in your face. And you look at his name, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's seven words. In the beginning, God created that the phrase God, the word God with capital G, God, 4,081 times. That is a seven times 583. It's still a multiple of seven in the King James Bible. The translators, there is not a chance in the world that they could have manipulated the Bible in their translation this way to make this come out this way. So, and I know some pastor friends that they say, well, we use the King James, we only use the King James, but I, I can't say that the King James is, 
is uh, inspired. I, I have a problem saying a translation is inspired. And, and you know, I don't get blistered over that. I, I know what I believed back years ago when I wandered in the non-King James Bible wilderness, and I did. So I have compassion on my brothers because I used to be like they were. Don't give up on people. People used to give up. You know Mike Hutzel? He hated my gut. Well, he didn't hate me, but he didn't like me back then. And you know what? I didn't like him either. Now he's one of my best friends in the world. Okay? God changed me. God brought me around. And you see, when it comes to translating the Bible, well, let's think about this thing for a minute. If speaking in tongues is a gift of the Spirit, then so is the interpretation of unknown tongues. It's a gift of the Spirit. And let me teach you something about this Bible. Does anybody know how many original languages it was written in? Anybody know? Three. Which, what, what three? Hebrew? Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Okay. Uh, does anybody here read, speak, or know how to translate Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic? No. And I got a B plus in Greek. I can read the words, but that's about it. So to me, they're unknown. So what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 14? If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most, three, and let one interpret. Who gave the unknown tongues? The Holy Ghost. Who gave the interpretation? The Holy Ghost. So I can say that I believe my Bible was translated by the Holy Spirit of God and be biblically correct in saying that. Uh, the phrase works of God mentioned seven times in the Bible. The phrase power of God mentioned 14 times in the Bible, seven times two. The phrase mount of God four times, but the phrase mountain of God is three times. That's four plus three is seven times. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Husbandman is seven times in the kingdom. Just whatever you call God, it's... Seven times. So I'll, watch this. The lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. All the generations from Abraham to David, 14. That's seven times two. From David till the carrying away into Babylon, 14. Seven times two. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Seven times two. Total is 42, which is seven times six. So when it lists the generations from Abraham to Jesus, there's 42 in that, in that genealogy showing us that he's perfect, that he's the one, that when he said, it is finished, there's no need for another Jesus to come along and finish it for us. Somebody say amen. Say that to your Catholic friends, because that's what they believe. And then, but there's another genealogy of Jesus. Anybody know where it is? It's in Luke chapter 3. It has 77 people in it, from Jesus going backward all the way to where it says, Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. And if you count from God back to Jesus, you've got 77 names in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The Roman soldier was right. Truly, this man was the son of God. God. Mm. Now, let's have some fun. The phrase church. I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word church is mentioned 77 times in the King James Bible. Why? Well, we're Jesus. We're his body. We are the children of the Most High God. Children of the Holy One of God. We have the seven spirits of God in us, and we read a perfect Bible. 
So the word church is going to be found 77 times in the King James Bible. But I got to show you this. This is cool. If you look at the, turn to Genesis 3.21. Look at, look at this. The 77th verse of the Bible. It says, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. That's the 70. Now, why did God clothe them? And they were naked. So the 77th occurrence of the word church is the church of the Laodiceans. And what's their problem? They're naked. And he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So the 77th verse of the Bible has God clothing the naked Adam and Eve. And the 77th occurrence of the word church has Jesus clothing the naked church of Laodicea. It's just fascinating to me. 77th chapter of the Bible is Exodus 27 in the tabernacle of the congregation. That phrase is mentioned 21 times in Exodus, 7 times 3. Tabernacle of the congregation is mentioned 133 times in the whole Bible, which is 7 times 19. Because tabernacle is the church. The congregation is the church. And that's in the 77th chapter of the Bible. And the church is mentioned 77 times. The word Passover or Passovers is also mentioned 77 times. Because when did the church get its start? Christ died when? Passover. And Christ is our Passover. And Passover is mentioned 77 times. The generations of Jesus and Luke are 77. The church is mentioned 77 times. I see similarities here. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized in his death. All the forms of the word baptize, 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 baptizes, baptizeth, baptizing. You say that 77 times exactly. Mm. Mm. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that phrase is 77 times exactly. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, where was Noah and his family during the flood? In the ark. They weren't on the outside hanging on going, Help! I hope we make it. Where were they? In Christ. He was keeping them in there. They were saved weren't they? And where was that? When did that take place? Genesis 7. And how many days did God say it was going to happen? Seven days. Mm. In Christ, 77 times, he is a new creature. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar. The phrase peculiar is seven times in the Bible. For we are his workmanship, workmanship seven times in the Bible. The phrase is witnesses, 49 times, seven times seven. Assembly, 49 times, seven times seven. Bride, we're the bride, 14 times, seven times two. First fruits, we're the first fruits, seven times in the New Testament. Fishers, I will make you fishers, seven times in the King James Bible. Kinsmen, seven times in the King James Bible. Daughter of Zion or Sion, 28 times, 7 times 4. Daughter of Jerusalem. All these are references to like the church and the congregation of Israel. Daughter of Jerusalem, 7 times. Children of Israel, 644 times, which is 7 times 92. I didn't find all this in one day, by the way. But my wife will tell you, I about drove her nuts when I was finding all this stuff. Wasn't I, sweetie pie? She said amen in her own way. Luke 10, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. 
and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. The phrase kingdom of God is mentioned 70 times. Now, watch this. And here's why. Remember what was in the 70th chapter of the Bible? That was an hour and a half ago. Ten commandments. How many commandments? So here's what the number 10 means. It represents dominion. Dominion. So Paul said in Romans 7, What? Know ye not that the law, Ten Commandments, hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So Pharaoh had dominion over the Israelites, and he wouldn't release him until God sent how many plagues? Ten. Then he relinquished his authority over Israel, gave them to God. God took them to Mount Sinai, gave them ten commandments, and then he tells Joshua, Joshua, when you get across Jordan, every place that the soles of your feet touch, I will give you that land. Now, what is significant about the feet and the number ten? You have ten toes. It's exactly right. So do you understand the number 10? The image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, it had a head of gold, chest of silver, legs of brass, but it had what? Of iron and clay. 10 toes. The beast has how many? 10 horns. Those are kings, and their 10 horns are 10 kings, the Bible says. Authority. The first king in the Bible is Nimrod, and he shows up in Genesis 10. Okay? So now, what, and how many years does Jesus reign at the end? 1,000, which is 10 times 10 times 10. Okay? So 10 is a number for dominion. So the phrase kingdom of God mentioned 70 times, makes sense, doesn't it? It's the kingdom. He's going to have authority. By the way, guess what the 1,000th chapter of the Bible is? Huh? I'll give you a clue. It tells you how you can see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God in the 1,000th chapter of the Bible. And heal the sick that are therein and come unto them and say, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. The phrase king with a capital K in your King James is mentioned 70 times. And that king is Jesus. He's king of and Lord of lords. And remember, those seven words. The words, so, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver trotted in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. That's the 490th chapter of the Bible. Seventy times seven. Now let me tell you what I think and these all have multiple meanings. Let me give you my thinking on it. 1604, King James of England is a, is a Christian king, and he knows that there's, there's a big fight going on between the Church of England and the Puritans that were in England. He knows that the queen before him, Mary, queen of Scots, was Catholic, and she spent most of her try time trying to kill all of the Protestants in England. She hated them. She was doing what the Pope told her to do. So most of the Puritans fled to Holland and Geneva, Switzerland, and places like that. That's where we get the Geneva Bible. The King James of England wants to unify the churches under his dominion. So in 1604, he convenes all the divines, they called them, 
heads of the Church of England, the Puritan leaders, and he said, let's get a translation of the Bible that doesn't have... You had the Bishop's Bible back then, which was what the Church of England used. You had the Geneva Bible, which is what the Puritans used, but the Geneva Bible had a bunch of stuff in it where... Because they hated kings. They hated... Any, anybody that was a king, they felt that they were, in, they were in rebellion to God. King James saw it different. He said, I'm a king. The Bible clearly says that if I'm ruling, it's because God put me here. So he said, I want the Puritans, and I want the Church of England scholars, and I want you to sit down, and I want you to get along, and I want you to retranslate this Bible as best as you can make it. So they took 54 some odd men, divided them up in groups, and in a circular fashion, they all worked on translating. Not one person or one group had any sway over what the Bible said. They didn't put in their own thoughts or their own individual doctrine. They stuck with the original languages plus the early translations that had been made. 1604 to 1611, how many years is that? Seven years. They spent seven years purifying the translation of the text of the King James Bible, and I think they got it right. Amen. The word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision. The phrase, the word of the Lord, 245 times in the Old Testament, which is seven times, seven times five. Lord of hosts, 245 times. Same amount of times, 245, seven times, seven times five. Uh, I'm almost done, by the way. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, the word faith is 245 times in the New Testament, seven times seven times five. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The phrase thy word is seven times in the New Testament. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. The phrase thus saith the Lord of hosts, 70 times exactly. It's the Lord because he's perfect, and thus saith the Lord of hosts. It's because his word is perfect as well. And God spake all these words, saying seven words. And remember, that's in the 70th chapter of the Bible. That's your Ten Commandments. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. How many times is the word word in that verse? Three, because it shows the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And yet, that's not the total number of times the phrase, the word, is in the Bible. It's in there exactly seven times, capital W, the word. And it's Jesus Christ. His name is called the word of God. And the phrase, word of God, is mentioned 49 times exactly, seven times seven. Brother Ernie, that was the first thing that got my attention. I typed that in, and I thought it was going to be like 50 times. Don't ask me why. And when I saw 49, see, I had the mumps when I was learning my sevens in school, so I kind of didn't know my sevens. So I thought, well, maybe it doesn't mean anything. So I just kind of laid my head back for a while, and all of a sudden, boing, I went, that's seven times seven. And at that point, I said, either that's an accident, or that's just a, a, a fluke, or just a random thing, <clears throat> or there's more in there. And from this point, I went looking for more in there. And it's in there. I've got two books, one called By Divine Order, the other one called The King James Code. And it has most of the number patterns and findings from the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 22, 23, 46, I've got all of this down on book, and if you would like a copy of those books, you let us know and we'll get you copies of them. Faith 245 times, Word of God 49 times, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, I noticed, can I do this real quick?
This is not like some sacred cow in here, is it? Right, I, and I noticed that. Let me tell you what I did. Uh, turn to, um, everybody turn to John 3. Since everybody kind of knows John 3, turn to John 3. Back in my King James Bible wilderness days, when I didn't believe this, I went to the National Association of Free Will Baptist meeting in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And the esteemed Reverend Dr. Piccarilli was going to host a little talk on the King James Bible at this meeting. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go to that, and I'm going to pick on all those King James guys because I didn't like them. I didn't like them. I thought they were all legalists and idiots and everything else. So Dr. Piccarelli gets up and he says, now, to those of you who say you believe the King James Bible, which King James Bible do you believe in? Do you believe in the 1611 King James Bible, or do you believe in the 1620 King James Bible, or do you believe in the 1650 King James Bible, or do you believe in the 1729 King James Bible? Because they're all different. And I went, yeah, you idiots, they're all different. And then my wife bought me one of these. So you're open to John 3, right? So I'm going to read to you from a 1611 King James Bible. And I want you to tell me if it's the same as yours. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Is that what yours says? Exactly to the letter. He lied to me. He lied to me. Now, in 1850, the American Bible Society, this same question came up over 150 years ago. And what they said was, is the Bible that we have now, which was a King James in 1850, is it the same King James that they had in 1611? So the American Bible Society did some research, and they wrote, a, they wrote a pamphlet. You can actually find this on Google Books. It's a free download. And their report was that other than printing errors and spelling differences, as far as the text of the Bible is concerned, it is exactly the same as it was in 1611. And they gave examples of some of the printing errors and the way that it was spelled. You can notice that it's spelled differently in here. So our Bible has not changed in over 400 years. Now, let me tell you a little something I know about the new translations, the NIV, the New American Standard, and so on. Did you know that the NIV, if you go out today and buy an, a brand new NIV off the shelf, and then you go to one of the used bookstores in the area and you find an NIV from 1980, they won't be the same. They've been changed, and I have, I have a whole presentation on this. They've been changed upwards of five to six different times they've been revised, just the NIV. So you can't memorize Scripture from a Bible as a child 
and then grow up and recite that same scripture because nobody will know what you're saying because the verse is probably going to be different 20 years from now. So which Bible would you rather have? One that changes every 10, 15 years? One that has neutered God? Because the NIV that's out now is the gender-neutral NIV. They sold it without telling anybody that it was. Or would you rather have a Bible that never changes? Let me do this. Um, by the way, the name Jesus, 980 times. That's 70 times 7 times 2. Now think about it. Lord, how oft shall we forgive our brethren? Until seven times? Yea, I say until 70 times seven. So when Jesus came the first time, he came to forgive Israel, his brethren. And what, did they let him forgive them? No. So he's coming again. And he's going to forgive the sins of his people, Israel. Seventy times seven Twice. By the way, the phrase son of man, 196 times, which is 49 times four, seven times seven times four. Son of man. That's Christ's name. Uh, Jesus Christ, also 196 times. So is son of man, 196 times. Seven times seven times four. And the word book or books. Um, where is that? Where is that one? I can't find it. Yeah, here it is. Son of man, 196 times. Jesus Christ, 196 times. The word book or books, 196 times. And Jesus is the book, people. He is his book. You don't believe? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was and still is. God. Now, I want you to do something. Uh, take your Bible, turn to the 777th chapter of the Bible. I'll help you out with that one. That one's Jeremiah 32. Turn to Jeremiah 32. Now, you look around this room, and you don't see 4,000 people in here. Now, let me tell you something. That ain't your pastor's fault. That ain't your fault. When Jesus gave the parable of the seed and the sower, he said that the good ground, the seed sown on good ground, would yield some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. I learned a long time ago, God, God got me by the nap of my neck and took a rod and taught me a lesson that he was the one in charge of who comes and who doesn't. And I believe that. I've been speaking to small crowds, brothers, ever since I've been doing this, okay? And it doesn't bother me a bit because I know God brought who he wants here. Some people just can't handle stuff like this, and they don't want it. Uh, some people, one of these days, God's going to turn them over to a reprobate mind. We just might as well figure that one out. We're, this is the last days. Amen? And we're fixing to find out who is and who isn't. And some people you know is going to be beaten on the side of the ark one of these days saying, let us in. Okay, but let me tell you why you're here. Set, remember, this is, this is the 777th chapter of the Bible right here. Write that down in Jeremiah 32. Write that down because you're going to see something here. Now, what I, didn't, what I didn't point out to you was this word book. The word book, 196 times, 49 times 4, it mean, it's the same as Jesus Christ. It's the same as Son of Man. 
and it's perfect. God has a book in his right hand sealed with seven seals. Okay? So that word book, I want you to understand, what is that book? A lot, a lot of scholars have said, well, the book is this, the book is the title deed to the earth, the book is this, the book is that. The book is what you've got. There's only one book. It is the word of God. When Ezekiel was called, a hand came down from heaven with a book in it, and he said, Ezekiel, eat thou, that thou seest. And he ate it. He ate the book, and it was in his mouth sweet as honey. In Revelation 10, John sees the mighty angel with the little book open in his hand, and he's told to eat the book. And it's same thing, it's in his mouth sweet as honey. That book, and, and when, Ezekiel, when Ezekiel ate the book, God then said, now go and speak to my people. So that book was what he ate. And Brother Ernie or any other preacher that might be listening to me, either here or online, you cannot preach. You don't have a right to preach behind the pulpit of God unless you have eaten this book. You cannot give what you yourself have not partaken of. If you do, all you are is just spouting off ignorance like a bunch of these big mega coffee shop churches you got in this town. Listen, I know what they're doing. They're downloading sermons. I went to Bible college with a guy that I won't describe him too much, but he was just not preacher material. By way of his character, his lifestyle, he was smart, don't get me wrong, and he could talk, but I'm just going, mm -mm. I find out he's preaching. So somebody sent me something in the mail, and it was a sheet of paper with the sermon outline, and it was, and, and they said, Pastor, we went and visited a church, and uh, it was in the Tulsa area, and they said they handed out the sermon outline, and you had to fill in the, some of the blanks on there, and, you know, we, we just, we didn't see this as being from God, so we're going to send it to you, see what you think about it. And I looked at it, and I knew the guy, and I read that sermon outline, and I went, there ain't no way this guy wrote this. No way in the world did he write this. And he had, he took a church, and I mean, it just exploded in numbers. So I took a phrase from his notes, and I typed it into Google in quotation marks, so Google would look for that exact sentence, because I'm going, he got this from somewhere. Sure enough, the whole sermon outline was from Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now. Word for word. And I'm going, that's him. He copied down stuff out of a book or had somebody do it for him. And he spent the rest of the week or whatever else. That's what these churches are getting. You got a preacher to preach out of this book. You hang on to him because they're hard to come by. And let me tell you why you're here. So the book is important. Now watch this. In Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah, this is before God is going to take everybody out of Jerusalem. He's going to move them into Babylon for 70 years. He's mad at them. He's going to keep his word to them. I'm going to kick you out. But I want you to understand that I'm not going to hold my anger forever. And I will bring you back. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this. So he tells Jeremiah to go to his, his uncle Hanamiel's son, which is his cousin, and his cousin has a piece of property, and Jeremiah has the right to redeem the property. Jeremiah is in prison, by the way. So Jeremiah sends word to Hanamiel, his uncle's son, and he says, let me buy the, the property 17 shekels of silver. There's a number there, and it's important. But he says, um, send it to me. 
And he said, uh, because I'm going to buy it. So um, in verse 9, Jeremiah 32, And I bought the field of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it. What was the book in God's hand? Sealed with seven seals. Who's the only one who can unseal it? Jesus Christ. Amen? So you're getting it. I want you to pay attention to these words. He's got a book that's sealed. It's a prophecy. You're reading the future, people. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the long custom and that which was open. Two copies of the deed in a book, one of them sealed and the other one's open. Think of, remember what I told you about Daniel and Revelation? Daniel's 27th book of the Old Testament, Revelation 27th book in the New Testament. Remember what I told you about that? Did you, you remember now that Daniel is sealed. At the end of the book of Daniel, he's told, seal up the words of this book, Daniel, until the time of the end. Daniel's sealed. Revelation. John was told, seal not the sayings that are in this book. Revelation is the book unsealed. Daniel is the book sealed. And you're looking at them right here in your Bible. One is sealed. One is open. And God says, um, let's see here. Verse 14. Take these evidences, the evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them where? In an earthen vessel. Have you ever seen that phrase before in your Bible? Turn to... Turn to, come on, come on, where is it? Ben, I had a lot more for you. You're lucky I'm passing over this stuff. First, Second Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You're the earthen vessel that God has put the book in to keep it because God said, God said, I want everybody to know that houses and lands will be owned again in this land. I'm going to bring my people back and I'm going to give them their, their vineyards and their farms back. I'm not going to be mad at them forever. And God took the evidence of that. He sealed it and he put it in us. Woo! I get happy. When I think about that, you know why? Because I'm going, God, why in the world did you pick me? And you know what God says? God says, Mike, because I know you won't try to change it. You see, Israel's hope and their promise is in that sealed book. And God hid it in us so the devil couldn't get to it and destroy it. Because if he can destroy the evidence of Israel's future salvation, he wins. But God found some people in Fort Smith, Arkansas, that he said, I trust you with this. Hold on to it until I come back. And then I'll unseal it. And you'll see what you've been holding on to. You'll see this treasure that we have in earthen vessels. Look at Ephesians 1. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. See, you were sealed. God put the book in you, Brother Ernie, and he sealed you. Are you going to hell? Ever? No. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased 
possession under the praise of His glory. It looks like that verse was written exactly to link up with Jeremiah 32. He's telling us to hold on to this book sealed up in us, which is the, you know what earnest is, don't you? If I'm going to buy, if I'm going to buy a car from you, okay, and you say, well, I say, you know what, let me, uh, yeah, I want this car, definitely want this car. Don't sell this car on me now, I want it. What are you going to say? That's called earnest money, isn't it? Because either I buy the car or I lose the earnest money. See, it's my way of telling you, I'm going to keep my promise. And God put this book in you. And he sealed it up in, in, in you and he said, this is my way of keeping my promise and showing you that I will not ever turn my back on you because you've got the book. Somebody say amen.